Welcome, everyone, to our sixth season of the Fishtails Lecture Series. And thank you all for coming. Uh, it's nice that it, we didn't get a snowstorm that prevented that. Um, I, and I want to mention that the uh, Fishtails Lecture Series is an educational outreach program of Crossroads at Big Creek, and we do it in partnership with the Door County Library. And that partnership has worked very effectively. We actually have improvements this time with our audiovisual, and Corey uh, Batson from Crossroads has uh, figured out a new system that the whole, the whole thing will work uh, even slicker than it has in the past. Um, and all those on Zoom, welcome. Um, and please pay attention to some of the rule, housekeeping rules on the right-hand side of the screen. So our first talk this year is going to be by Dr. Dan Eisenman here, uh, this quest for nest and, and revisiting the issue of nest fishing and smallmouth bass recruitment. Uh, he first presented last year, and now he's got another year of data um, with new insights and so on, so it'll be very um, rewarding, I'm sure, uh, for his presentation. As far as the rest of the uh, Fishtails lecture series, our next speaker will be Dr. Patrick Forsyth from UWGB, and he's going to talk about the success of passing sturgeon over the Park Mill and Menominee dams on the Menominee River and how they've tracked that. They've, they started passing those fish, I believe, in around 2009. So they have uh, a whole bunch of cool data. It's going to be a real cool story. And there's been a lot in the news lately about uh, listing of lake sturgeon and that kind of thing. Well, this project will demonstrate what managers are doing to try to uh, restore that population in the Menominee and the interesting ways they have uh, for uh, approaching that. So that'll be very good. On March 14th, Dr. Emily Tyner, who's the Director of Freshwater Fishery Science at UWGB, will talk to us about the NUR, the, the uh, National Estuarine Research Reserve. Uh, you've, locally, you've probably heard about that. Uh, I know that the city is interested in having the visitor center be located in Sturgeon Bay. But even if that doesn't happen, there will be a reserve property uh, that includes crossroads, the Ship Canal property for the Door County Land Trust and the DNR property around Strawberry Creek that have been uh, requested to be part of that reserve property, which really means that they'll have areas that they'll, they'll develop a cooperative agreement with to allow them to do research there. So the big question I have asked uh, Emily to address is what kind of programs is the NOAA, uh, this is a program under NOAA, what kind of programs will they bring? What kind of research, what kind of monitoring, what kind of outreach? So at least she'll explain to us what life might be once it gets established. And then finally on April 11th, uh, Dr. Karen Murchie, our, our favorite uh, sucker lady, will be back. She's uh, from Shedd Aquarium. She presented a couple years ago. But just like uh, Dan here, she's got new data including this acoustic telemetry. So she has uh, transmitters in Sturgeon that were tagged in Sturgeon Bay in Samuelson Creek to be specific. And so now we'll be able to track where they go, where they go out in the lake, out in the, do they stay in Sturgeon Bay, do they go out in the full bay? And, and just with a couple more years of research uh, from her will also be um, very interesting. So please make every one. So just a little bit on, on Dan Iserman. I don't want to take too long, but uh, he serves as the unit leader of the U.S. Geological Survey uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin uh, Cooperative Fishery U Research Unit, and that's located at the UW uh, Stevens Point. He conducts fish research on fish populations across the state and trains graduate and undergraduate students who are eventually employed as fish biologists with state and federal agencies. And he's received degrees from a bachelor degree from Southern Illinois University, master's from Tennessee, and a PhD from South Dakota State. So I'm going to quit talking and hand it over to him because it'll be a very enlightening talk. All right. Thanks, Thank Mark. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Got a good crowd. Um, and I am going to talk to you about smallmouth bass recruitment uh, along the Door Peninsula. Um, I do work for USGS, as Mark mentioned, stationed at the university. I would say about a third of our research is focused on Green Bay, um, about a third of it we focus on Lake Sturgeon and the Lake Winnebago system, and about a third of it is focused on uh, walleyes and muskies in northern Wisconsin. So we do kind of work um, across the spectrum of the state. And we do quite a bit of work on Green Bay. Uh, we have a lot of focus on smallmouth bass right now, but we also do quite a bit with 
uh, whitefish, the sturgeon work that Patrick's going to talk to you about. Um, we were a big part of the early stages of that in the passage program doing telemetry. And we've been working with Karen on her sucker project too, so a lot of different species. And today we're going to focus uh, mostly just on the nest fishing side of this. I am going to talk to you a little bit about the telemetry work that we started with smallmouth bass. Most of you in this room, I probably don't need to tell you these things, but uh, the Door Peninsula and in the surrounding area are, are a destination fishery for smallmouth bass, meaning that people come from all over North America to fish for smallmouth bass here and other portions of the Great Lakes. So bass are one of those species that actually has sort of really benefited in a lot of ways from some of the changes that have occurred within the Great Lakes Basin. So you can think about Niagara River, Apostle Island, Shawamigan Bay, Door Peninsula, there's all the western basin of Lake Erie, all these places that sort of saw this boom in smallmouth bass. And that attracted a lot of attention because these are really, really good fisheries. So people follow the fish. And now they're a really important component and a really important money generator for a lot of these communities. Um, even in places where, you know, walleye were king or some other species were king, smallmouth bass have become pretty important. And uh, that attracts a variety of anglers, um, including tournaments. Um, Sturgeon Bay and the area is definitely a prominent destination that some of the tournament trails use. And then there's local regional tournaments that occur there. Again, very similar to some of these other locations. So the Door Peninsula is actually a really good model for a lot of other places in the Great Lakes. So while we're really studying things at a small scale here, it's applicable at a, at a broader scale and a lot of folks are interested in what we're doing. And what we're gonna talk about mostly today is uh, bass during their nesting period. And um, those of you that fish are probably already familiar with bass life history, uh, but they are nest builders in shallow water typically the male is gonna guard the brood, the eggs and the brood for a period of time. And during that time, uh, they're pretty aggressive. And so the theory is they're you know, more prone to be caught during that time than they would be at other times of the year. And we know this is a well-studied uh, process. Most of the studies have been in smaller systems because it's just a lot easier to do. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting things we've learned about, you know, how the size of the bass dictates, like how much parental care pro they'll provide and how many eggs they have in their nest will dictate how much parental care they'll provide. And so a lot of really interesting studies have been done on this process. And so this is, in my mind, um, just like with any fish species, you're starting this process of making a year class that eventually will be fish that you'll catch that are three, four, or five years old. But it starts at this point. And then there's many sort of bottlenecks or hurdles or gauntlets, whatever you want to think of along the way that these little fish have to make it through. But it starts kind of at this point. Um, and and what, we, what, the, what we hope is, is we get fry. These are smallmouth bass fry around one of our nests in Detroit Harbor. And then sort of the phase that we usually measure recruitment, and this would be similar to walleyes and other species, is we come back at the end of the summer and we try to catch them as age zero. So they've made it through that, that first summer. And we were doing this in like August, late August into early October in these, in these places to see how many age zeros were out there. So what do we know about bass recruitment? Well, we know like every other species that it's really, really variable and, and mother nature really decides how many of those fish are, are gonna make it. And so the big things that really matter and can really explain these large fluctuations and how many fish you see from year to year are, are things like water temperature. You know, like a nice steady spring that warms up, you know, nice and easily through time is generally really good. Uh, a bunch of bass coming in, laying their eggs, and then the temperature dropping 20 degrees is not very good. Or a big storm event, you know, that's something that can wipe out a lot of nests within a certain area. And in a lot of places, water level fluctuations are really important. Um, you get into reservoir environments and the water's moving up and down, or river environments, they can be really important. Uh, but there's been a lot of research on it, and these things are, are what we kind of know are important. And 
this list would apply for any fish species that we work with in fresh water. It's not something that's unique um, to bass. So what we've seen happen over time uh, around the Door County probably reflects variability in, recruit, in, in environmental conditions. And previous studies tell us this is almost always the case. Uh, but we don't necessarily know exactly how that works along the Door Peninsula. And one of the things that we've worked on is trying to develop an index that we can use to monitor recruitment moving forward. And so um, we use this modified electrofishing in the, in the sites that we're going to talk about tonight. And that seems to provide the most efficient way to catch these little bass. And that's something that we're going to work with the DNR folks to continue so we can start to test whether that index tells us anything about how many bass there might be four years down the road. Because it's really useful if you know very early on whether you're going to have a weak ear class, whether it's going to be a strong ear class. It helps us to sort of, as anglers, you know, you can, we can sort of manage expectations a little bit um, and we know what's, what's coming down the, the pipe. And so that's part of what we're doing. Uh, but I want to focus more on, on the nest fishing part of it tonight. And so one of the things that this is a very, this isn't something that's unique to our area. Um, I actually have some old in fishermen sitting in my basement and there's been articles written on this since probably mid eighties into the nineties. It seems like once a decade, there's at least one sort of expose on should we, or should we not allow nest fishing for bass? And so Fishing mortality happens in a lot of ways. Uh, a lot of species worry about harvest, right? So walleye or perch or bluegill where the fish, you know, most people or at least a lot of people are going to catch that fish and take it home. We would call that harvest mortality. Uh, catch and release is the, the prominent way that most people approach bass fishing. And from research, we know that most bass survive this process. It depends, obviously, on water temperature and um, things like if they've been in a live well for a really long time. But for the most part, they have fairly high survival from that process. So given that most people let the fish go and most bass survive this pro process, like fishing-related mortality, I'm just going to say is probably not high enough to really regulate how many fish you're going to see from year to year. Uh, so that leaves us with, with nest fishing. And this is a concern for some stakeholders. So one of the things we did to sort of kick this research off is the DNR held several public forums where we actually talked to folks about, let people talk actually, um, about what they thought was happening and where they thought this might be a concern. And, and that helped us sort of think about how we wanted to approach the research. and. <clears throat> where we might want to do it. And so the concern is that when I'm, we, we have, this is some, some video I'm going to show you. Again, this is a bass that's going to be on a nest and it's guarding its nest. Uh, we have people that are, that are targeting them. And so again, they're, they're pretty aggressive at this point in time. They can be easier to catch. Um, and this fish is going to eventually pick up this well-placed night crawler uh, and then you know things happen that bass is uh, preventing predation I mean it's guarding the nest and usually working pretty hard to do that so this this and this person took forever to hook that fish but um, this is just one example uh, we didn't see this very often but there's a few places in Sawyer Harbor where you get a lot of centrarchids and um, when that bass came off, uh, this could happen, but this doesn't always happen. And it really, it, it really varies from nest to nest. And it's not a guarantee that you're going to pull that bass off the nest. And that's the end of the story. And so there's a lot of literature out there on this from all these previous studies. I think we found somewhere over 20, somewhere between 20 and 30. And I'm going to talk a lot tonight about nest success. And all that is, is whether or not that nest produced fry. Because you saw that one picture I showed you of the Detroit Harbor fry. It's not real easy to count how many fry there are around a nest. So if it made fry, we consider it a success. And part of our reason for doing that is that's what all these previous studies had done. So we wanted to remain consistent. 
so we could compare things. And so what we do know is that when you pull that male bass off a nest, the probability of that individual nest being successful goes down. Um, it, but it does not mean it's a guaranteed failure. So, and we see in the videos that we took, there are a lot of cases where the bass gets pulled off the nest, there's no predation, and that bass is right back on the nest in a really short period of time. And so, even though the angler removed it, the nest may not have been affected by that process. But the real question is, we don't, we don't manage fish on individual fish or individual nests. Do we see effects at the population level? And my opinion of this is that it probably would operate on a gradient, right? There are probably places where it might be an issue. If you're up in Canada in a really infertile lake and the water's really clear and you don't have a lot of bass to begin with and it's real easy to find them and fish for them, maybe that's a scenario where nest fishing could have an effect. On the other end of that gradient is something like the Great Lakes where there are thousands of bass spawning in many different locations um, and the probability of it being a factor at the region wide scale might be kind of low but if you think about each one of those locations as its like own individual population or stock then things might be different the one thing there is no peer-reviewed published study that has shown nest fishing has population level effects so I've heard many people talk about data that they have to show that it's true, but it's never been peer reviewed and it's never been published. And so I don't know if it exists or not. Um, there's some modeling out there that suggests it could happen under really specific conditions, but the model didn't include a lot of those major environmental factors that we know are really important. And there are actually several studies that have shown or suggest that it has no population level effects. So, um, and this is just sort of the lit review we did when we started this. So, regardless of what's already out there, we set out to try to figure out if nest success, and then again, eventual recruitment of smallmouth bass along the Door Peninsula might vary in relation to those environmental variables that we talked about and then nest disturbance, anglers actually removing bass off the nests. And this is the, the student, Eric, that did all this work. So I'm just here basking in, in the glory of all the work that he did. So for the last two years, all of the things that I'm gonna tell you about were conducted by Eric. Um, we had a lot of help from the folks out of the Sturgeon Bay DNR office especially with our fall electrofishing. And Eric is now the black bass biologist for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. So it, it played out pretty well for him too. And he's gonna be continuing to work on smallmouth bass and other bass species uh, in Arkansas. So these are the locations that we went to. And there's some reasons why we chose them. One is we wanted to have both sides of the door covered because exposure to the lake is a very different environment than exposure to the bay. Um, the other thing we wanted is like some level of protection because we know storms from like previous work on Lake Erie and other places, they're like the overriding factor. Like if you just have a big storm event come through, it's gonna wreck a lot of nests. And so we were probably gonna lose our ability to see whether anglers influence nest success if we just went and chose somewhere that was really really susceptible to to storms they're also known spawning habitats and places where the dnr does conduct sampling so that was another key thing we we want to have this index somewhere where like scott and and others are going to go sample so i can say well there's this many age zero bass back in 2023 four years later how many four-year-old bass did you get and we don't want to have to go do that in places that we're not already sampling. So there is a several different reasons we chose those locations. So the first thing we wanted to measure is the intensity of angler effort in each of those embayments. And so this is sort of like a creel survey, but we weren't talking to the anglers. We were relying on the DNR creel surveys to give us some information on like how many people were in each boat and how long were they fishing and things like that. 
how many people were targeting bass. All we did is count boats. And we did this with a map in hand. We actually marked where every boat was on every day that we counted so we could create these like heat maps through time and we could see how many people were out there and where were they fishing um, re in relation to where we knew nests were located. And so that was really the, the main goal of this process. And so we did that in both years from about mid-May um, through the point at which Fry left the nests. And so that was sort of the end of our spawning period when we would start going out if we weren't seeing fry anymore, we called the spawning period over. Um, and then for nest success, we worked with uh, transects in different parts of these bays and they're shown up here. And we did them at three different depths, uh, shallow, um, uh, medium and deep. And the shallow and mediums we could do from the boat and I'll show you here in a minute some of the things we did to do that. The deep nest, we had a remotely operated vehicle, so like a little submarine that had a camera on it. We could swim it around and look for nests. Um, we weren't 100% sold on that method, so we actually got uh, Scott and folks from the DNR in one of the years to do some ground truthing by just snorkeling to make sure that we weren't possibly missing nests by using that ROV. But these are the transects, and we just repeatedly ran these, I don't know, once a week, every five days, whenever we could get out there. You had to have the right conditions to do it, though, to be able to see the nest, which is probably a lot like nest fishing, probably the same kind of conditions. Uh, one, of the, one of the things, this cone, it's kind of uh, cuts the glare, and you can actually really see the nest really well and so this is an example of like what one of these nests would look like through that cone um, it's pretty obvious that's probably a bass nest there's a couple eggs there They're, they weren't always this obvious but um, that's sort of like the level of glare that it would cut down on the water and we would uh, we would go to the nest or run the transects and we were measuring whether a male was present um, nest survival is basically, you know, we're getting at nest success, whether or not fry survived. We did try to like relatively estimate how many eggs or fry were there, how many predators were around, and then we were measuring these um, environmental factors. And we had these 30 nests in each place that we focused on. We called them focal nests and we tiled them. They had a single number tile on them, really tiny tile, and so we knew it was the exact same nest that we were coming back to over and over and over again um, to record this information. We had temperature loggers at each of the different depth stratas in each of the bays, so we could look at things like how variable was, were the water temperatures in those locations? Was it going up and down all the time, or was it nice and steady? And then we can calculate growing degree days, just like crops or plants on land, growing degree days are very important to explaining how fast fish grow and are often linked to survival. So we were measuring that as well. Our information that we use for storm frequency, we got from the uh, weather station here in Door County. The nest disturbance part was the funnest part of this. And so we built these GoPro housings and this is an unpainted version, so you can see it. And we would just set them on a nest and leave. And they were painted to look like a rock. They were like a tan brown. Um, and we would deploy them. They would run for an hour and a half. That's the most you can get out of the batteries. And then we would just keep redeploying them and trying to get as much footage as we possibly can. And this is what we use to estimate how often is a nest disturbed by anglers like on a per hour basis in these different locations and then what happens when you pull a bass off the nest and that's where that bluegill video came from so that was gopro footage of one of the bass on the nest and this has not been done in previous studies uh, but we thought it was a pretty unique way to try to get at this um, and it generated a lot of footage as we'll see here in a little bit so we'd watch the videos. I say we, I didn't watch a single video. Um, Cause the, at first the plot is really exciting. And then for the next hundreds and hundreds of hours, it's the same story. And mostly what it is is bass sitting on their nest. 
chasing. So it's really exciting when something happens. Um, but a lot of hours of technicians and Eric sitting. And we were looking at how often were they disturbed by anglers, how many events, even when they weren't disturbed, like how often were they chasing. And in a lot of these places, like where those bluegills are in Sawyer Harbor, those bass are busy. They're chasing those things all day long. A lot of times when it's just gobies around, the, the gobies don't come in the nest. They, they kind of, I think they kind of know that that might be a bad deal for them. So the bass is not chasing as rigorously as it is when those bluegills are around. But then also like what happens when uh, it comes off the nest. So time absent. There's a lot of times where these bass are absent from the nest longer when they're not caught than when they are caught because they chase something off and they don't come back for like a minute. Um, and a lot of, sometimes when they're angled, they're back in a shorter period of time. How many egg predators were in the area? Whether egg predation occurred? Could we see any hook wounds? And then what was around the nest? Um, and we're not going to get into details in about all of these today. But So some of this is a little more complex, but we used a variety of models basically to try to determine whether this big list of things here influenced whether a nest was successful or not. Um, so nest depth. Are nests that are really shallow more likely to be successful than nests that are deeper? If our nests in a place with more storms, less likely to be successful. And I'm not, you can probably read through that list. You know, we got angler effort and how often the nests were disturbed in a certain area. So these are all of our predictors that we're trying to say, does the probability of nest success vary in relation to those variables? Um, and then we had that electrofishing at the end of the summer. So we've gone from the bass have hatched and now three or four months have transpired and we go out and measure how many of them are, are left at the end of the summer. So similar variables, but the one big difference is I can now use that nest success rate and the other things I saw during nesting to see how well they predict how many bass there might be at the end of the summer. So I've got nest success and then I've got my age zeros at the end of the summer. All right, so what did we learn? Um, at least in these locations, uh, most of the nests are really shallow. We, we did not find a single nest out in that deeper water. So that may occur in other places. Uh, one of the things that we learned, um, and I have this a little bit later in the slide or in the talk, is that there is a lot of people that were mistaking distance from shore with depth. And they would think, they would be like, oh, well, they're nested deeper out here. And it's like, well, no, this is actually still less than three feet of water. It's just really far away from, from the bank. And so a few people that we talked to about it, uh, that was some of the confusion. And this again is just a picture of another successful nest. So we would come up to this nest, it's successful, and then we would try to roughly say, is that a lot of fry or not a lot of fry based on how many we saw? And you can imagine like how accurate that a lot versus a little, not very accurate, but we did do it. And this is um, our nesting period. So what I did here is I broke out um, the two bays that are on the bay side, Sawyer and Little Sturgeon, and then the two bays that we considered sort of lakeside, Detroit Harbor and Moonlight Bay. And I just made them different colors to help you keep track of what's going on. And so you got your, your start of your spawning window, and this is 2022 and then 2023. So if you just look down here, mid-May to the 20s of May, both years, and then your end. And you're gonna see like sometimes things ran all the way to the 14th of July. Um, and what we would see is in some of these locations, especially moonlight, I mean on one end of our transect, like on the inside of the bay, it might be 50 degrees. And on the other end, it would still be like down in the 40s. A wind event would come in. There would be a whole bunch of bass nests made, gone. They'd do it over again. But and it would just like delay that process of those fish. Like the last um, 2023, yeah, this one was the longest. But yeah, moonlight was really extended. You can see like 
The other three were done on June 5th, June 8th, and June 16th, and Moonlight went another two weeks of, of you know, fish still on beds with eggs until fry dispersed, and this is the overall duration of time. Um, and again, we were out there, I don't know, three, four, five, six times during that window monitoring the nests. And this is just like one example of those angler effort maps. Uh, we have lots of them, but the yellow dots are where the boats were, and the black dots are nests. Most of those nests are ones that were on our transect. Um, there's a few others that we, were, we knew were there, and so we marked them. It doesn't mean these are the only nests in these bays, but they're the ones we're aware of. And what you can clearly see is that we did pretty well in getting a gradient of effort. Uh, Sawyer and Little Sturgeon Bay, significantly more effort. Detroit Harbor should have no yellow dots, uh, but we ran into a few people that weren't aware of the regulations, and I forgot to mention that. The key reason that we chose Detroit Harbor is it is closed to fishing during that period for bass. So it was like our reference site. I sincerely apologize for not doing that. So what we should see is that there shouldn't be any yellow dots here, but a few people were um, out there. And Moonlight Bay, just not a lot of folks were targeting bass that year. This would have been 2022. And again, this is how we're going to generate our, our effort. All right, so from the video thing, uh, we had 623 hours of nest footage over the two years, and we had 39 events where anglers disturbed the fish off the nest. Um, and this is just one of those blotchy bass. Again, another video with that tube jig there. And eventually he gets it. So 39 times a, a cast was made is basically the way it is. And we're actually going back through all of this and trying to figure out how many of them were the same person like casting multiple times and how many of it, how much of them were just somebody happened by one cast hits the nest and they either gave up or they didn't even know the nest was there and moved on, whatever the case might be. And then this is like the bulk of what we did. So we're going to stop here and spend a little bit of time. Again, I split the bay and lake, different colors, and we'll just walk through this. So the first, this is the, the number of angler hours or effort that, that was targeted at bass. So based on the Wisconsin DNR Creel survey, a certain percentage of anglers said in some way, shape, or form they targeted bass during that time window. And so you can see Sawyer and Little Sturgeon, lots more effort. Um, Detroit Harbor actually zero effort those people that were out there I don't know probably wisely if somebody asked them they said they weren't targeting bass so it showed up as a zero so maybe a little bit of effort there uh, but this is how it played out and then here's the cast per hour from the videos and so you can see like Sawyer and Little Sturgeon Bay when we watch the videos uh, they're, they're being targeted along those transects like far more frequently uh, than these other places. So, and I've got to look into these a little bit more. I would, I would basically take them as sort of a relative measure at this point. I'm not exactly sure we can translate it into a fish is sitting there in every 0.38 of an hour, or you know, that percentage of an hour somebody's casting at it. The point being though, these two have much higher disturbance rates, much more angler effort. And you can see like, and what we saw in 2023, there was a lot more effort and a lot more angler disturbance in the two bays, these two bays. And that's going to be important as I show you some of these other results. And it is really important to look at here. So here's the number of nests of those 30 that we monitored over and over again, the percentage that were successful. Um, so you can see 55 and 48 in that first year, and in both cases, they're lower in the second year. The Great Lakes average, so there's about 10 other studies on the Great Lakes is 43%. So in that first year, Sawyer and Little Sturgeon Bay were above average for other places on the Great Lakes. And then even in the second year, so Little Sturgeon, 
uh, was below the Great Lakes average in that, that second year. So that's how these numbers played out. Again, we're kind of working on this a little bit. The numbers might change in some way, but the relationships and the relative, the relative relationships will be the same. So a lot more disturbance in the second year in those two bays. And then this is, remember, this is coming back at the end of summer and looking at how many age zero fish there are. So I, I put the nest success rate back up there again, so you can see how, how it played out. And this time I just have Sawyer 2022 and then followed by 2023. So 55% nest success, 12 bass an hour. Drop the nest success, fewer bass per hour. A lot of other things going on besides nest success. But you can just see how those, those lay out. Um, and this is that index that we're going to use moving forward to figure out, does that number there tell me anything about how many bass I might have down the road three or four years down the road? All right, so how about all that fancy modeling I talked about? What did it, what did it tell you? So one of the interesting things is if you look at this, and, and there's a lot of ways to interpret this, according to my analysis the harder you fish for bass the higher their nest success will be <laughs> now it's the same kind of correlation as the number of churches and the number of bars across towns in wisconsin you have more people you're going to have more of both and this is probably really a reflection of better habitat means more fish and more fish means more people fishing for those fish and it's that same kind of relationship but yeah, so, you know, if I, if I was really diabolical, I could just say, we, we need to disturb more nests and we'll get higher nest success. But this, and the reason is, all of these things that are in gold are all correlated together. So, the growing degree days during nesting, that warming rate or how many good days of growth they're getting, that's probably something that might influence nest success logically. It just happens to also be correlated to how, how many people fished in that. And that could be just due to good weather, right? The weather's nice, more people go fish, they disturb more nests, but because the weather is nice, more nests are gonna be successful whether you're fishing for them or not. You know, that kind of that thing. And so the two years on the four places make it hard to really tease this apart, right? I'm, I'm stuck with angler effort as the best predictor of nest success. And I, I would have to say, the more I fish for them, the better the nest success rate is. And I know that's not a biologically reasonable argument, um, but that's how it played out. However, I could stick growing degree days during nesting down here and get a similar re relationship. And that does make more biological sense um, they just have to be correlated. The more nests there are, the higher rate of nest success I have. That, that kind of makes sense to me too, right? So, um, but that's what we have at this point. And we'll dive into that a little bit deeper. And I hope you can see these. I try to get them both on the same page. But this is now going to the end of summer. What matters or what helps me explain how many bass I have at the end of summer? And the best thing in our models is the nest success rate. Um, you can't see that number, but it's a really bad number. So it's a really, really poor predictor. And you can see the relationship. If I took that dot out, it'd kind of be a flat line. And so, but it's the data we have. Uh, the other thing that is important or was important was the total number of growing degree days over the whole summer. Uh, Made, made it so there was more age zero bass. And this is one that commonly comes up if you look at previous studies. All right, so what I'm just gonna kind of try to sum all this up. Uh, we found that most bass, at least in these habitats, I do not want to say that there aren't bass nesting in deeper water somewhere else besides here, but they were in shallow water. Um, and again, farther from shore is not necessarily deeper. I, we ran into a lot of folks that were struggling with that. Um, one thing I didn't really cover when we, when we laid those effort at maps out, and I'm going to backtrack here to these dates. 
So this was sort of our benchmark, the peak of nesting. This is when the most males were on the nest with eggs in the nest. Most of the angler effort happened before that, that date. Angler effort had actually started to decline. I'm not an expert on all the tournaments, but I think most of the major tournaments, or a lot of them, happen you know, before some of these peaks. Uh, but we, if you look at our effort maps and you lay them out by week, you'll see that a lot of the effort was done before that peak happened. There were certainly bass on, on beds when some of those things were going on. Uh, but the majority of fish, the most fish on nests, a lot of the effort uh, had declined. Not all of it, but had declined. All right. Um, yeah, most of the effort happened before we saw peak nesting. The other really interesting thing, you know, we talk to people at boat ramps all the time. And a lot of people, the bass would be shallow. There wasn't a nest in sight. And they, they were talking about the bass spawning and being on nests. And it was just, you know, a different, very wide group of people that are fishing for these fish. But we'd get to the ramp and they would say, oh, yeah, the bass are spawning. And we were like, well, we're... We just got off the water and we're like seriously looking for bass spawning and we didn't see a single one. But they were up shallow, right? Like up in shallow water. Uh, and they just were thought that they were they were nesting or spawning. And then what I what I that church's bars relationship, one of the things that is obvious in hindsight, but better spawning habitat is gonna mean more bass and that's gonna mean more people. Uh, more people fishing for them. It's going to attract angler effort. Better habitat also means higher nest success. So those bays that are facing the lake because of that exposure and storm events and that really crazy temperature gradient that I talked about, I mean, those things are relatively undisturbed in terms of angler effort. Pretty low nest success because of those environmental variables that are, that are happening on there. What we see in Little Sturgeon and Sawyer is that even with relatively high angler effort, uh, we can have better than average nest success, at least for the Great Lakes. Um, that doesn't mean it couldn't maybe be better than that, but it's at least better than average. And so the, the one message is like low angler effort in a place that has not good habitat is not going to like necessarily guarantee you higher nesting success places like Moonlight in Detroit. And then this is sort of trying to make some sense out of this with two years of data. So if we think about across the four sites, I would say, again, the more, the more I fish for them, the better they do, which doesn't seem to make biological sense. Um, but if I go back within the sites, if I just look at Sawyer Harbor, and I ignore all the other variables, you could look at it and say, well, for the most part, in the second year, when I had more angler effort, I had lower nest success. Uh, but at the end of the day, nest success is not a very good predictor of how many bass we saw at the end of the summer. Um, so then the question remains, does it really matter? Um, if, if the number of nests that are successful isn't what's dictating how many fish I have at the end of the summer. So what we need is like always more years of data. What would be really interesting to me is really focus on Sawyer and Little Sturgeon and like continue to try to monitor nest success and how many fish we get at the end of the summer to better understand if, if it really does really does matter. But we saw a lot of other interesting things out there and talking with Scott and other folks. There, there, there are several other really plausible reasons that there may be fewer bass along the Door Peninsula and other places in the Great Lakes. So I wasn't here 30 years ago. I don't know what Sawyer Harbor and Little Sturgeon Bay look like, uh, but I'm suspecting that they looked pretty different than what they do now in terms of aquatic vegetation and species composition. There's a lot of largemouth bass in, in those places now, and a lot of bowfin and a lot of gar. And so if these warm water species have benefited for, um, in terms of abundance, these smallmouth are now hatching into an environment with a lot more predators. 
And so one of the things that we're really interested in trying to look at moving forward if we can is just to what degree are these other fish preying on smallmouth bass after they hatch. And then the other big concern is largemouth bass virus. Um, Scott and others have been working on testing and trying to figure out, you know, to what extent a bass in, in the, around Door County have the virus. Um, there's been some recent work that's shown that it can trigger mortality in age zero bass related to warm temperatures, like later in the summer if it gets really hot. So Pennsylvania was having a bunch of age zero bass die off, smallmouth and some of their streams, and that's what this paper is right here. They actually did some lab work to show that it's possible that that's responsible for some of that, some extra mortality or additional mortality. So we're trying to get funding to continue this work. So this initial work was funded solely by the Wisconsin DNR. Uh, they provided the funding to, to do the work to help address these questions, and we're trying to leverage that pilot funding to get additional money. We would continue to do what we were doing, but we would add a component to look at the, or components to look at these other two factors. How many age zero bass have largemouth bass virus and how many of those might die? And how many little smallmouth bass do I find in the stomach of a 12 inch largemouth bass in the, in the middle of summer, that sort of thing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the first part of this and just thank again the DNR for funding. And then we had a lot of help from a lot of people and also thank the Smallmouth Bass Alliance. They've been very supportive of our work. And then we did start this telemetry project. And this is really looking at connectivity of different populations of bass spawning in different places. Are these all separate individual entities or do they actually mix? Um, do river fish, are there resident river fish and transient? River fish, those kind of questions. So this spring, last spring, we put transmitters in 200 smallmouth, 210 smallmouth bass in these locations. Um, and they are now out there swimming. And we have receivers in a grid located all throughout Green Bay, all the, river, all the major tribs. There's a lot of receivers around Sturgeon Bay. And we're starting to track the movements of those fish and again, DNR folks and Fish and Wildlife Service is really integral in us collecting that data. We did download the receivers once, but we don't have enough information really to say a whole lot about anything. I will say we already had a few Egg Harbor and Eagle Harbor fish that came down to Sturgeon Bay pretty quickly after we tagged them in June. Um, and one fish that was tagged in the Econo that got caught in Eagle Harbor that had swam across the bay in some way, shape, or form. We're not seeing a lot of detections out here in open water. So they're sometimes leaving these locations, but it doesn't look like they're just going out in the bay and wandering around. If they are moving around, they're moving along the shore. And I'll just show you, I got one more. This is one of the fish that we did in uh, Eagle Harbor, and this is just us, uh-oh, letting it go. Maybe not. So I'm just checking the sutures there and off it goes. And we tagged a bunch of different sizes. They do have a brown loop tag on the end of them. Um, but we made it brown because we don't really necessarily, we don't need like the transmitter back or anything. And um, so you might see it, you might not. I think we've had some 16 or 17 of them have been recaptured out of the group, and we suspect that a bunch of them have been, and people just didn't notice the external tag. But that's all I've got, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I can stop this thing. Let's give them a hand first. So if you have a question, to make sure it gets recorded, I'll hand you the mic and we'll make sure that uh, the system will be able to hear it. Are there questions? <laughs> First off, you know, I'm glad to see that we're doing some smallmouth research because it hasn't happened. But when we were asked in the, <clears throat> in the very beginning of this where we thought you should be doing your surveys, that was tough for me because the numbers of beds in those areas 
aren't what they used to be. Yeah. You know, it's not even close. So are the fish spawning in different areas, or are they not spawning, or are there less fish? Is the, some of the questions I think that have to be answered. One of the things I think that's really important, and there are records on bed counts, and, you know, it was done on the flats, it was done in Sawyer Harbor. I think bed counts on a yearly basis would be important, see if they're going up or down, if the, you know, the, the areas are changing. Sure seems like that's the other one. Yeah. Um, there was not a lot of mention on, you know, gobies, and there are a whole lot more gobies than there are bluegills, and we know that. And we, you know, we've seen the videos that the DNRs had out there on what, how quickly they can empty a bed of eggs, and so, you know, they haven't gone away. I think there's less of them, but I don't think they've gone away at this time. And the other thing is a lot of the. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, the the bed count thing is really interesting, and I know like they've you Scott they've snorkeled. I I don't know what the time timeline of those things would be but if there is some of that and we could like repeat it and maybe look at it that would be interesting uh, the goby thing it, it's built into all of these models and i mean there were definitely nests where we had tons of gobies around them but in the end it just wasn't related to nest success and like i said when you watch these fish on those videos I mean, we didn't statistic. Well, we do. We have the chase frequency. They're lazy when the gobies are around. Like, you know, if somebody pulled one off a nest, uh, but you'd be surprised, like, the gobies are, I know I've seen the videos too, but they're surprisingly shy compared to the bluegills. And I think they're kind of like looking around like, is he really gone? Because it can't be a good thing to go into the nest when, so... We did measure it in a couple different ways, but it just never came out in the models as being important to So I guess success. that brings up my next question. Most of your looking at beds were a fish that was removed and then pushed back in the water in a very short period of time. How about a fish, for whatever reason, is not coming back? Yeah, and we did have some that did not. And then what happens to bed? It, bed? it just depends on what's around. So it can, it can actually, like, nothing can happen. If there's no predators, it takes a while for something to happen. But if there are, so I don't know, we might have had one or two fish that actually didn't come back. So is another fish is not going to take that bed over. Um, bluegills mm. generally will fit, spawn in bass beds if there's nothing on yeah, it. Yeah, but, I mean, we're only watching for maybe an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah. So, But within that t amount of time... It just depends on who's in the vicinity. Like, if you don't come back and there's a bunch of gobies or bluegills, I'm sure that well, I, nest is going to be... I think that it's pretty easy to say that if a bass doesn't come back, their oh, yeah. bed success is right, right. zero. Yeah, you're so, correct. Yeah. If it doesn't come back... I mean, honestly, I don't know. The fry could still hatch. You know, the bass isn't... It is sweeping and... So I don't know. It could still hatch fry, but I I would be willing to just say that's probably not a good good thing. Yeah, and we did have at least one or two that did not come back. So other questions. I saw on that one slide in Moonlight Bay the nesting disturbance was very low, but the production success rate was also very low yeah is that attributed to other environmental factors or predation do you think or what's your yeah analysis? so the the growing degree day thing that being one of the important factors that regulated both nest success and how many age zero bass we had at the end of the summer if you go look at you might not be able to see oh oh it's all right I was just going to point out, like, you can, probably can't see it real well, but, like, the points that are down on this end of the plot that have very few growing degree days, those are probably Moonlight Bay. And so it's just a colder environment, and it's really uh, a lot more volatile, like, temperature-wise during that, that early phase. Like, we would see fish come in and then leave and then come in, and, like, they'd be nested on one end of the transect but not on the other, and then 
eventually they would all like kind of set up and we had one event there that basically wiped out everything that had started then they came back in and started again um so it's just a really tough environment for them to pull it off but they do um whereas on the on the bay side it's a little different and i don't i don't know like maybe the flats you know probably different even still because it's kind of more exposed than than the bays would be other questions can you give us a, a summary of the life cycle of the smallmouth and age average age um on, on the fish as well as how long do they live what's the expected sure i mean basically we kind of talked about it at the beginning they're going to come into these typically shallower water habitats in spring that would be you know starting in mid-may as we showed and uh, males are going to start to build the nest they do go through courtship um, and, and try to secure females and there's definitely some evidence to show like bigger males are more successful at that that sort of thing then we go through that hatching process uh, it'll be three or four years maybe sometimes even five it just depends on where you are before they're sexually mature and and would spawn you know from hatching to that point would be that long they can live into their teens I don't know what the oldest fish that we've had, like otolith wise, has been. I, I'm looking at you, I should probably know, but yeah, 15, 16. Like the fish that we did, that I worked with on Lake Erie, like 18 was a really old, old fish. But they can live into their 20s in, in some places. Um, it's just in the Great Lakes, like it, in around the door and like the Western Basin of Lake Erie, they grow pretty fast, like relatively fast. and growth and mortality are, are negatively related. Faster you grow, faster you die. But that's kind of it in a nutshell. I don't know if that answered what you're, yeah. yeah. So that's why we got to wait three or four years to kind of validate that index because they won't show up. They wouldn't be a fish that anglers would really target um, until then or if the DNR would set fike nets, that's about when they start to show up in those nets. Yeah, so I just have a question on, uh, do you have a sense or is there a sense on the sex ratio out there, males to females? I'm just wondering if there's a limiting uh, issue there with that, with a sex ratio um, between the, in, within the fish, within the species. I don't know for the... So it's really tough, it's very difficult with bass and take a lot of species, it's not so difficult, but females, So the one, the one thing that we know generally, not necessarily about just the door, is that um, female bass do tend to live longer than male bass. And that's because, I mean, the spawning for a male is a pretty strenuous exercise, you know, so it's probably a source of mortality for male bass. So they, they tend to grow about the same rate and that kind of thing, but... Females will sometimes or often get larger just because they live longer than the male. So there you probably are going to end up with like a little bit of, of um, skewness at older ages where you might have more girls than boys, but at younger ages it, it might be the opposite. Yeah, I, I kind of asked that in relationship to this re-nesting phenomenon. 
you know, if a nest is destroyed or disturbed, and um, what are those? What are those females doing? Just hanging out in the vicinity? Yeah. So a lot of times, many times that the nests were destroyed was before eggs had been laid. In Moonlight Bay, it definitely was some nests with eggs, but a lot of the time it was like they come in, they made a nest like really early. They were kind of on it, uh, but they don't get super loyal until they get eggs. And then... The, then the nest, the, the like storm event or whatever it would be disturbed them. So I don't know what would happen if you had all the females that laid at all spawned and then you have a storm event. I don't, I don't think that would be a good thing because I don't, I don't think there's like another wave of girls waiting to, to come in, but they do spawn at different times. Like the theory is larger males and larger females spawn earlier than smaller males and smaller females. And that's like a good insurance policy, right, against this environmental change. You, you wouldn't want all of your fish to come in on the same day or the same week because if the storm happens the next day, you're done, you're done. But if you have fish that are just continually spawning over a month, or more, that's probably a much better policy that at least, or pr approach, so at least some offspring are going to make it through that, that window. I, I just, if I could, I just have one other question, kind of in a different tact. Um, you said most of the nests are under, in water under three feet, and I'm just thinking about the lake level variations out here. And do you see any legacy effects of... Uh, you know, years after a uh, very low water level uh, that you might have some, that might have some influence on at least where the beds are. Yeah, I, the, most of the nests are really shallow. Like I'm, I'm using three feet to be like kind of generous. Most of the nests in those places are shallower than that. So, you know, chain, water level fluctuations at, at like the feet level I think would definitely influence like the availability of those near shore spawning habitats. You know, so higher water I think would probably expose more of that habitat and lower water might might subtract it. And like some of these, you know, like Eagle in particular, I mean there's a there's a pretty definitive drop in a lot of places where that that shallow littoral zone comes out and it's kind of rocky and then all of a sudden you're you're in deeper water and the fish you know are wanting to be up in that that shallower water again i don't i don't doubt that there's some bass out there spawning in deeper water because some of the previous work on lake erie the eastern basin showed that a lot of the nests were out deeper it's just in these places where we were looking we didn't we didn't find any Yes, I, I want to make some comments. Uh, what I've observed in the last six, eight years, uh, I lived uh, along Lama Wama Lagoon, which is about 1,100 feet long, and one end <coughs> empties into Sturgeon Bay, and the one side of that lagoon is predominantly docks, and the dock side is not as deep as the center of the lagoon. So... This year, it's going to be a shallow year. It's going to be two to three feet along those docks, right up, right up next to the edge. You know, I would say two feet out from the shore. And this has happened. Uh, a, a warm, shallow time has happened. Uh, uh, one other series of, uh, I'd say, the first three or four years I was here, and then we had that deep uh, water come in. The deep water was a big difference in nesting. Now, every, about every 10 to 12 feet along that whole five or 600 feet of dock, docks, there's a nest on a, night, on a good year. That's a lot of nests. <clears throat> and then uh, when it was, when it was uh, deeper, we could barely find four or five on the, along the whole, mm. whole place. Yeah. Now, I walked my dog three times a day along that dock side, uh, at least three quarters of it. Yeah. I have a lot of time on my hands, so I can. <laughs> I, I think I've seen a lot, and I've, I'm not a, 
uh, I'm not an expert by any means, but every one of those nests has a bass on it for, for about six weeks, middle of May to the end of June. I can't, my eyesight isn't good enough to see uh, uh, eggs at the bottom because there's a lot of rock and sand and it, it all yeah. blends in. But I've seen schools on a good year, I've seen large schools of fry about a quarter inch long. Uh, uh, and on, on, a, on, a ba on the deep years, I, I hardly saw any. Hmm. And so <clears throat> I think uh, most of what you've been talking about, I can concur with. Uh, the, uh, uh, we have no effect of storms, so uh, uh, the, we're in a protected area. And the only thing that causes a current is high water to low water. And, and if a storm is in the area, well, then we have, uh, that's a low pressure, so it's, it's high water. Hmm. And uh, if it's, of course, if we have, a, if it's a sunny day, we're going to have uh, high pressure and lower water. So that's the only thing that causes a current to come in and out of our lagoon. Perhaps some temperature variations, but that's yeah. so it's a very slow. So we don't see effects of storm, yeah. so, and so the sto the nests last a lot longer. In fact, more species will come in after that. They're little um, uh, the, sto uh, the the rock bass and then the uh, perch. They'll take turns using those nests. Hmm. That's very curious and it's very productive on the at least. Uh, when I see a lot of fry in schools, you know, yeah, uh, that that and they don't in that area in our area they don't stay next to the nest they go right to the cover which is weeds we don't like the weeds so much but it's there and it is cover and the DNR is right they need that yeah yeah that would be one thing I don't know if we took our like course counts of like how many fry we thought we saw. And, and ran it in any of these models just because we were a little less confident in it. But I, it, you talking about it kind of spawned, you know, that could be something that we we think about. I, I think that's why, like what Gary was saying, I'd like really interested in, it would be really nice to be able to continue the nest monitoring, but it is intense because um, of so many things happening. And we're trying to get more funding to do it. We're probably for sure not going to be able to do it this year because Eric's gone and we're on to other things but because I am really it would be really interesting to be able to do consistently like most of these things over a five-year window or something and really get a better feel for what's going on and I would yeah we can talk about maybe the bed count data is something we could look into trying to replicate and look at trends um, yeah. Well, I've got a question. Before I do, I might turn to the Zoom participants. If there are any of you that want to ask a question, just unmute your computer and speak, and we should be able to hear it here. Are there any questions? They're blue screened. Okay. Hearing none. <coughs> so. The GoPro cameras, the battery would last an hour? Hour and a half. And so there are batteries, waterproof batteries, that last four hours. And the waterproof batteries lasted two hours in a bucket in our office before they weren't waterproof anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but yeah, when the battery a, would run out, would you replace them in the same day? Yep. So it just depended. So some nests got like four to six hours of continuous monitoring, sometimes only an hour and a half. But they would just go to one of the sites for the day, immediately go out and pick the nests that the GoPros were going to go on, drop the GoPros, and then go do something else so they weren't around the nests. And right. a lot of times, like, or at least some of the time, they actually could see the people fishing you know so we kind of knew there was probably going to be something on the video because we knew people were fishing in the area but then they might use the same nests over you know repeatedly i don't know how many nests i didn't have that in the 
like is, how many individual is nests. there a time of day effect at all in terms of disturbance or whatever oh but, yeah but would you have missed i mean if you didn't put in a fresh battery at seven in the morning you'd miss that time of day yes so we tried but, to but i was just wondering how yeah. you account for time of day and all this you, you would have to spend a lot more time doing it than we did it but, okay, so maybe a better question would be, what times of day did you send So I would say most of it, it would have been obviously like during daylight hours, but it would have been, it would have been spread out from like morning and evenings. It wasn't always the same time of day, but I'm pretty sure we probably didn't do it enough to that I could tell you between 7 and 9 it's this and between 9 and noon it's this. Okay. And, but at some point... We probably had cameras out at at all of those time blocks, but it was it's just very hard to pull off when you also have to run a transect and get to thirty nests and see if they've got fry and count boats and everything else. So it was more of like when we were going to that location, the cameras would go in the water, and then they would just keep cycling them through the whole day. Oh, so they would replace them in that day. Oh so, yeah, so yeah. You yeah. Four times you got six, if they were six there seven from hours, yeah. dawn till two o'clock in the afternoon, they'd they have observation. The yeah, yeah, okay. they would so just keep. And a lot of times compressed. we were just swapping the whole camera. We just bought enough cameras that we would just swap them. We'd have at most like six or eight out at a time. Yeah. And they fail. If you've ever watched YouTube, you'll learn how fun GoPros <laughs> are. Okay, any more questions? I figured that Gary might have one more, or two, or three. Uh, just, just one, basically, and I mean, there's a lot of smart fish people here that have biology degrees. So. Just to clear up a lot of things, give me your pr opinion on the spawning period. You know, the fish are in the shallows. Are they, is that part of the period where they're looking for a spot to build a bed, looking for the correct water temperature? Because we're kind of basing it now and when maybe when they lay eggs but there's a lot of effort prior to that yep and effort after that yep so is it two months yeah i don't know i feel like the first part of it in some ways is just warmer water like mm -hmm. the fish are just coming into the shallows like it was pretty awesome we were there tagging on eagle harbor like the day they showed up and it was just amazing, like how many bass there were, like it, it, everywhere you went, it was incredible. And and they were not, you know, in any way, shape, or form showing any kind of spawning behavior. It's just that the water had warmed up to that temperature. And I don't even know if all those bass even stayed in Eagle Harbor. It might have just been the warmest water they could find nearby, and then eventually they leave. And and the telemetry, I'm hoping, is going to help with that like how early do fish show up and do we have like egg harbor fish and sawyer harbor but when the time really comes down to it they they go they go to where they are going to spawn yeah so so when you from when they showed up to when they made a nest how long was that and then when there were eggs in the nest how long was that and then from the egg period to fry and then how long did the male protect those fry until they left so I don't have that. Well, I, we have a table of that in, uh, in Eric's thesis. Like we tried to break it up into kind of those windows that you're talking about, like pre-spawn eggs, pre, you know, like we pre-spawn for us anyway was up until like we saw our first eggs in a nest. And then like guarding was like from the first eggs in a nest till the first fry or we called that the egg stage and then there was fry have emerged to the point that there were no fry fry had dispersed and that's how we broke it up but i didn't i didn't have all that in the so but last year the time between when they came in and when they nested like was shorter than it was the previous year because we we had to kind of like eric, eric came up and it was like oh yeah nothing's going on and we were up here tagging whitefish and nothing was going on and then it was going on really quick and so the year before there was a more of an extended window between 
the year before was really when we had all those people saying, oh, the bass are spawning, and we're like, no, nah, they're, they're probably not. I mean, maybe somewhere, but nothing on our transects yet. So there's a little bit more time between there where people could have been fishing on them, per se, like before they nested. But it's not, it's more than weeks. Yeah, I would say it's probably... Six weeks. Well, the whole time is probably more like eight weeks. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's kind of what I was looking right. for. Right. It's generally closer to eight than six, but I would say between six or eight. If you added up what I had here and then add a couple onto the front end, when they're in shallow, but they're not really spawning. I just have one quick question. Sure. Uh, based on what you've learned over the last couple of years, has it affected your research design at all for going forward? And, and I specifically, um, uh, do you learn more by reducing the number of sites but focusing more intense research on one site? And just thinking logistically, I mean, it's a lot of effort driving around to right. four sites. Yeah, w I think moving forward, I would probably just focus on Sawyer and Little Sturgeon um, just because, well, it also relates to like some of the other things we might be interested in. Part of it's logistics. But my question now is, in a place with good habitat and pretty high nest success, over years, would you see, could you tease out whether angling actually is influencing nest success anyway. And it still might mean that nest success has nothing to do with how many fish I get at the end of the summer, but I'm just really interested. I wish things wouldn't have played out this way, but they never go how I want them to. Like, I wish I could have just come and said, yep, everything's cut and dried every year. Everything went exactly the same. This is what we think. But that's why I have that mung sites it looks one way but if you look within a site so i'd be really interested to just like track sawyer and little sturgeon over time and keep doing the nest counts and keep doing everything and then see and keep shocking bass at the end of summer and see what happened and it's not not that i i'm not interested in moonlight bay or detroit harbor but i think that side is much more obvious that the environment is for lack of a better word, God. And on the bay side, it's a little muddier weather. How, you know, obviously the environment was still very important, but there's still that like kind of nagging question of because of the way things laid out. I could just run with the harder you fish them, the better they do, but it would never get published with. <laughs> But that's what my student, he said, everything's, a, everything's not going well because what we're going to say is that the more nest disturbance there is, the better they do. One of the benefits we have here is well, we, have this, we, we have what they call a portfolio effect here in, around Door County and, and that, like Dan touched on, the, the, there's a lot of um, people that tend to say that thing, fish behave regionally or... or basically at certain scales, but if you look, and I've written a lot of reports on these, and it's it, not the fact. We have subpopulations. We have a metapopulation of bass. We have subpopulations that behave quite differently in terms of recruitment, um, spawning success, even growth rates probably to a certain extent, although most of our fish here grow really well. So all around the peninsula, we have these microhabitats that it's really hard to get a hold of. Like, these guys took on a huge task to try to characterize what's going around Door County. It may sound simple, and it would be simple in a 100-acre lake or simpler, but here it's, it's simply not. The complexity is, is really high, and, and, we've, and we've seen this in our population assessments that one can go be going this way and one can be going that way. Um, even between Little Sturgeon and Sawyer Harbor at times, ones that are populations that are fairly close and do intermix. Yeah, that's why I think the telemetry will be like really interesting to see is Little Sturgeon Bay its own like bass entity or Sawyer Harbor its own bass entity or is it really like the five or six bays within 10 miles of each other really are 
the fish go wherever they end up for the most part. Maybe some are loyal, uh, but there's a fair amount of straying. And are you going to take some fish that are have a transmitter off a nest and dislocate it? We are going to do a displacement experiment this year is our plan. Um, I don't know if we've actually ever talked about them like being on the nest because they might be. It's more of like trying to target that window of time when tournaments are occurring or a lot of the bigger ones are occurring to see what they do. So what? Okay. Yeah, we're, we're like looking at it in two ways. We're going to tag bass in these locations and see what their natural connectivity is. Like do, so do all Sawyer Harbor bass that we tag always come back to Sawyer Harbor to spawn and they never mix with anybody else anywhere? Or do they sometimes end up in like Sturgeon Bay or a couple of them in Egg Harbor or whatever? Well, if they were all like really discreet and then we do the displacement experiment and that disrupts that, then that's where you would start to be able to say, well, if I move fish this far, I'm potentially like disrupting their natural connectivity where this group and this group would never mix. Um, Cause there's some genetic evidence that, you know, they are isolated in some way along that gradient, you know, not at like a species level, obviously, but some, some evidence that they could be their own individual units at some scale. Great. Well, this is all very interesting, and thank you so much for coming over and informing us uh, about your work. Thanks. Yeah, and if you have other questions, I have my email, but thank you. Mm -hmm.